winners. Welcome to 2024 and our first episode of season two. I hope you're all enjoying the after holiday calm and that this year has been good to you so far. Of course, I'm not alone today. We've got David with us. Hello. This is where he says hello. Like we haven't done this 20 times already. (laughs) (laughs) Um, And we have, we're trying to think of the best way to kick off our new season. We've talked a lot about it. We knew we had to go big. And we're really excited in this duo. This collaboration is one that I've been waiting for for a long time. Please give me a, uh, join me in giving a huge warm welcome to Jane and Declan, hosts of Brutal, Bizarre, and Boozy podcast. Hi. Thank you. Hi, guys. Welcome. (laughs) Hi, everybody. How's everybody doing? Doing exceptional today. How are you guys? Good. Good? Yeah. (laughs) I'm bringing the energy as you can (laughs) say. Yeah. (laughs) Thank you so much for joining us. Um, Me more so personally, but both of us, we've been really excited. Um, Like I said, I've been waiting for this for a long time. I listen to you guys regularly. I love your show. You guys know I'm kind of all over your Instagram a lot. (laughs) Ordinarily, I would have gotten with you ahead of time to like make a cool cocktail for our episode just to pay homage to your guys' setup. Um, I my liquor cabinet is bare bones right now, so maybe next time we can definitely come up with a a recipe together. Yeah. Um, I really was trying to pull that together to make that a theme, but it just didn't work out. But that's okay. I wanted to start off, if if we can, with just asking you guys how you came up with your podcast, what spawned your creation, and where do you pull your inspiration? So we are both huge fans of both true crime podcast and anything including the bizarre, like UFOs, Bigfoot sightings, like weird conspiracy theories things like that so we just we would like catch ourselves telling each other stories of podcasts we had heard and like all these weird stories that we had heard of so we're like if we're already telling each other these stories might as well just record it and have some fun with it so that's kind of where our podcast originated from yeah. Oh my gosh. I love that. Yeah, so have you, um, you guys like started it out at the very, at the very beginning when you were brainstorming ideas together? I mean, who kind of comes up with like the content Do you guys go back and forth with the episodes that you deliver are your own or how do you guys decide what to do, what to cover? So we just kind of find stuff that interests <laughs> us. Yeah. I mean, I don't know about you, Declan, but I will oftentimes just, hear a weird story and go, Ooh, I want to know more about that. Let's go find out more about it and research it. And then we'll talk about it on the show. And, um, so I might hear about it in another podcast or read a weird story and then look further into it or those kind of things. Very cool. And then when you're, um, I was really curious about knowing how you guys come up with the drink recipes that you do, because you guys come up with some really unique ones that I've never heard of anywhere. And they sound, some of them sound good. Some of them I, sound good until you guys taste them. And then you're like, Ugh. <laughs> and it convinces me yeah. maybe not worth trying. Yeah. But how do you come up with these? We've had some bad ones for sure. <laughs> So what what I like to do is typically I'll find a story first because I find that easier for my brain for some reason. If I'll find a story that I really like and then I'll take one aspect of that story. Like if there if it's like a true crime story and something very specific was used as the murder weapon, I'll look up a drink like 357 Magnum cocktail or something like that or maybe oh. the location that it came from I'll look up like what's a popular drink from that location things kind of like that is how I do it I like to find the story first just because I I've tried looking up the cocktail first and then you'll look up like a fancy cocktail from a specific city or a state and then you go to look for stories and it's kind of boring and so i find it easier to look for my stories first okay have you guys ever created your own drink come up with your own special no i haven't no i don't think i don't think either one of us have because we always send each other Mm -hmm. the recipe and there's always a link and so i typically do the same thing although there's been a few times where i have wanted to do a specific drink and then went to just look for any story that seemed interesting from the area that, you know, like I think 
I think I wanted to do a Moscow mule one day. So I went looking for any kind of interesting story in Russia. But mm. most of the time I find the story first and then try and find something that links back to the story. Genius. I love it. That's like one of my favorite components of your guys's your, I don't know, I guess a recipe for your show, I guess I can call yeah. it that. Yeah. Uh, but that's one of my favorite parts. Yeah. It's always so fun. <laughs> and then you guys try them. And then if you guys like them or not, and, uh, it's, I really enjoy that. So I just wanted to be nosy and ask how you came up with that. Cause it's very cool. Yeah. Well, when we first started talking about doing the podcast, we were talking about, because we both like to cook, we thought about doing like something food wise. And then we realized no one wants to hear anybody chewing on a podcast <laughs> so we, yeah. we ditched the food <laughs> idea weird. and said how about we make cocktails instead so that's yeah. actually so funny because i'm trying to picture someone telling a story between mouthfuls like <laughs> yeah it's not good with the clinking <laughs> of the fork in the background right oh yeah yeah and then she killed him <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah no one wants to hear that oh my gosh that's great so my next question for you guys is kind of just like a fun icebreaker to get our audience who hasn't heard of you, if there's anybody even out there like that. Um, who, David's um, excited. Yeah. David is excited. This is I love it. It's one of my so favorites. this is called Red Flag, Green Flag, and you can take this as silly or as seriously as you'd like. Uh, basically, a red flag, green flag is one good thing about yourself that someone who doesn't, doesn't know you would say is good without knowing anything about you, no bias, and then something that somebody would say is a red flag. So it can be Anything under the sun from ugh, I sacrifice lambs at night, ideally not, to I don't like mayonnaise. <laughs> Anything under <laughs> the sun that, that vibes with that green flag and red flag. Okay. Declan, you go first. Okay. I'd say green flag is my cooking abilities. And my red flag is that I, I don't like that. to do dishes. So <laughs> those go hand in hand, though. Be. Yeah, they might yeah. conflict with each other, but the way I do bit. it is if I'm cooking for someone, they could take care of the dishes and it wouldn't kill them. Yeah, that's true. Okay. I think we we kind of unfortunately, I think we instilled that in you when you were younger because we told you you didn't have to do the dishes if you cooked for us. Yeah. True. I think it's. I think True. it started there. <laughs> oh, oh, that's those are good flags. My bad. <laughs> okay, my your bad. turn, mom. Okay. Um, I would say my red flag is that I hold a grudge like to the death. If That's you me. cross oh. me, I, <laughs> oh. I'm done. I, there's not a lot of second chances. If it's really bad that you have got on my bad side, we're, yeah, we're pretty much done. There's not going to be a lot of coming back from that. It doesn't work out very well sometimes, but. So that's your, that. is that your green flag? That's my red flag. My first flag. That's a red flag. Okay. That, that is was... the best red flag I think we've ever had on this yeah. show. That's the best one. red oh. flag. I love it. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, I would say that wait for my, the green flag. my green flag is that um, I am, I will do anything for a friend. If you need my help, if you call me and you're like, hey, we got this going on. Can you help me? I will do whatever I can to help you. So Those are really complimentary flags. Like, did you I mean, notice that they both them, kind of? Yeah, it's like, like the reversed of that, right? Yeah, like, I'll cook. Yeah. I'm really good cook, but I'm not washing dishes. I will <laughs> never speak to you again. But if you're my friend, I'm there. I got yeah, you. that's true. Just don't piss that's me true. off. Yep. Just don't, don't piss me piss off. Me off. <laughs> I love it. That's oh, great. those are those are really great flags. I didn't expect that. Those were no kidding. Thank you. Those are great. Yeah, those are good additions to our hall of flags. Yeah, yeah. yeah We're gonna have to like, like that start segment. a whole like anthology of flags. Yeah, and you guys can be like the the new bar. Like this is the bar that is set now. There we go. And everybody else. Goes. <laughs> Oh, gosh. So for our next one, um, this one is our question of the week from our last episode. And I want to get your guys' answers first. 
So obviously being the new year, our question was very simple. What is your new year's resolution? If you have one, or if you believe in that, do you guys set any resolutions year after year for yourselves? I never have. Well, that could be a good thing. Yeah. Make it till next year. That's my resolution. Yeah. (laughs) Make it till next year. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) David, do you set any new year's resolutions? I, I used to, that used to be a big thing for me. I would have lists and I would follow them. And um, I just started to try to live better each day. So I, I don't really do resolutions anymore. As yeah. long as I did better today than I did yesterday, I feel like I'm, I'm moving forward. I do set goals for certain things. It's always important to set goals right? if you want to improve. Yeah. But um yeah, resolutions now. Have you ever noticed that everyone goes to the gym January first and yeah. like yeah. in the middle of February they yeah. stop, right? That always seems to be the yeah. case. Mm-hmm. Do I don't know that many people that yeah. even make it to February, honestly. <laughs> yeah, I say I mean, that's pretty <laughs> <laughs> giving them know, a lot of credit yeah. there, David. It's after uh, January they start to I try to <laughs> add yeah. some yeah. Yeah. Hmm. So we had a few answers because we do post our question of the week on Instagram. So we had a couple people chime in with their own answers. I just want to read a couple of them. We had our friend Stacy, which with all the gifts, she said to just do better as a wife, a mom, and a human. Which was a good, a good one. Yeah. Tales, trails, and taverns said to be a guest on one nothing. How could there be a better resolution? <laughs> Shout out, that's a cute one. Like that's that. so cute. That's yeah. nice. I know cool. it was sweet. Murder Coaster Podcast said to stop wearing my socks in the shower. I know if I can do it, I will just find the willpower to succeed. Wet oh. socks. Oh, okay. oh that's yeah. gross. That I, can't. <laughs> I, I can't. I can imagine that would stop quite a bit. Ugh. <laughs> that was bad. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Cryptid Wild said, I want to buy a castle this year. Not sure if that's a resolution or a goal, but it's pretty cool either way. That would be awesome. I would like a resolution. Castle. What was yeah. your resolution last year? If that's this year's, like, no kidding. <laughs> Working up and up. Thank gosh. Last year was the it White was House. Specific. The year before that was a mansion. What yeah. if it was Cap- Castle Grayskull or something like a little. Oh, right. <laughs> right. Yeah, model. it's just a model. Yeah, just yeah. a model. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Buy I mean, a model you castle. didn't necessarily, you didn't necessarily lose your resolution. If it's if real, invite us. Through. Yeah, and no if you kidding. build it like Jane's saying, that's probably even better because, like, then yeah. you feel fulfilled afterwards. <laughs> Our friend Amanda slash Frankie, the Northern Siren, she said to ignore my self doubts and go for things I want and lean into them more. Wow, she's nice. doing that now. That's I good. think she sure is. Luna Leaf said, I don't call them resolutions, I call them goals, and mine are to keep coming out of my shell, be more outgoing and confident take care of and respect myself to leave the past in the past and let go of people and things when necessary to improve my finances, get a place of my own, hopefully a camper slash RV to live in and renovate and to get moving on my paranormal related plans and my craft business. Sorry, this was so long, but I need a life makeover. That's a lot of goals, girl. You can do it, Wendy. You can do it. You can, but that is stressful. But it's a lot. (laughs) Maybe you take them one at a time, but you'll make them all. You'll do it. Oh, you can do it. She's doing a great job. My girl Nisha, her hot garbage show, said, I don't make resolutions because I push myself to follow goals all year. New Year's resolutions are cursed yes. because everyone falls off and doesn't do them. Yeah. Yeah. That's excellent. Yeah. I agree. That's kind of how I feel about them. And it's sensible, sensible, I think, to do that. I am a believer, um, but I'm not a see-thrower. So I'm, I'm big on, like, I'll make a goal and then... Towards the end of the year, I'm like, you know, I had a rough year. It's not my fault. But it's- <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. That's our that's our good buddy from High Garbage. She's awesome. And yeah. She's, she's actually she's been great. on uh, a documentary recently that came out. Oh, really? Like, remember? Yeah, yeah. She was on uh, Tubi. Yeah. Uh, oh. For Jeffrey Dahmer. Ooh. I think it was calling Killing Jeffrey Dahmer. She actually appeared. She was great. Oh, wow. Show. Yeah. That's cool. Oh. Check it out. It's really awesome. So those are some phenomenal answers. Thank you guys for answering as well. I love doing question of the week and hearing from everybody because you guys always come up with just really good stuff. I, I just love it. 
So now we are going to go into, a few, I feel like this is like a college essay. We're going to do a few <laughs> episode related questions now. So Uh-oh. we have done a few episodes now where someone follows their passions, kind of at all costs, like even if it nearly kills them. Would you guys ever let the threat of severe injury or death stop you from like your dream job or a passion that you wanted to fulfill? At one point, would you just kind of take a knee or are you going to keep going? Oh, uh, why not? No, I don't think I'd let that. <laughs> um, yeah. So you're going to keep going? My dream job is to be a race car driver. So that's pretty dangerous. Oh my gosh. Okay. So if you were a race car driver and you got in a really gnarly wreck where you escaped with like an inch of your life, are you going to go back to driving for race cars? Probably. It'd be hard to tell unless I'm in that situation, but I'd like to think I would. Okay. So you're definitely a follower of your passions at all costs. That's respectable. What do you think, Jane? I don't think I have any passions that would threaten my life just in general. I have a lot of interests and things. And I mean, I've done a lot of things where I've gotten injured, slightly injured, no major injuries, but, and I still keep going back to them, but I also think I'm going back, but it's not like I'm going to die from it. I don't know that if I had that overwhelming sense that I was going to die from doing it, I don't know if I would go back do it again I'm kind of a chicken <laughs> i guess it's hard to say without being in the moment too but yeah david i think i asked you this once before but refresh me are you are you giving up your passion or are you going to keep at it it reminds me of the episode and the question you asked from the guy that was getting electrocuted or struck by lightning oh yeah 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 mm-hmm. I and remember you had that asked one. that question and i remember saying that if it was uh something that would possibly kill me, I probably wouldn't go back to it. But um, I'm trying to do that now. I'm trying to follow my passions now. And I do have, I mean, I've had issues uh, physically that haven't stopped me yet. So I guess today, I guess today I'm doing it. It's not okay, stopping going me. Going for it. That electrocution right. or not. Yeah. Yeah, right. <laughs> Baldness or not. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Ghost so, Rider. Sorry. Yeah. So if there was, um, this is kind of a different question, but if there was some kind of an emergency in a public place and everyone around you is acting calm and normal and nobody's panicking or freaking out, are you guys, do you think you're less likely to take an emergency seriously when the people around you aren't reacting like that? Or are you typically like self-preservation, F all these people, I'm getting out alive, doing whatever I can at all costs? Like, How do you think that would affect your ability to respond in that scenario? Leaving. I don't. If I see something weird. (laughs) Yeah, I think. I I think I'm. I'm. I'd have to say I'm more on the self preservation. I don't think I'm going to be sticking around to find out, and I'm going to. Isn't there something weird that goes on in big crowds where people, if everyone's kind of remaining calm, then like everyone else will? Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, it's a like a like a mob mentality kind of thing where exactly you know, if everyone freaks uh, yeah. out, then you you go with the mob. If they stay, you kind of stay with. Yeah, that, that's definitely a, a like psychological if you see a, thing. Yeah, if you see a big group of people running, I'm. Right. I feel like inclined I'm to run too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Exactly. I'm running where the in the direction they're running, not against the flow of traffic to find out what's going on. No, I'm not going to go find out what's going on. Okay. Solid answers. David, did you really answer that? You were saying that if no one was moving, but there was something that was like an intimate danger type thing. Is that what you were saying? Yeah, there's some kind of an emergency and you're aware that it's an emergency, but everybody around you is acting normally. Like, is that something that you're more or less likely to react because of that? Yeah. Like Declan was saying, that I, I think that plays a part in it. So if no one's reacting, you kind of, you're not trying or thinking about it. You just you go with the group. Um, it I would ha- it would have to fight against that to to get out of there. I think the first thing in my mind would be, uh, I'm not dying, so I'm leaving probably slowly, <laughs> but I'm leaving. Yeah. That's what I'm thinking. But it's hard to. It's like it, you see all the birds flying in one direction. And all of a sudden, they all turn another. It's kind of there's something up here that with you're with a group, 
you react the same way the group does. It's just a third yeah. mentality. Thing. Yeah. I'd like to say that I would also leave, but I, I do see that I could potentially fall prey to the, the artificial safety that that would almost yeah. provide. Knowing that nobody else is panicking would make me feel like immediately like the threat wasn't as significant because of that. So I, I don't know. I would probably have to be in the scenario to tell, but my fight or flight instinct is pretty good. So I'd like to say I'd run, but I guess we never know unless we're in it. So I these are all also relevant. depends on if you can see what the danger is, you know, Good like point. if there's a fire and other people are ignoring it, I think my brain is going to go, uh, yeah, you guys need to be paying attention and I'm out of mm-hmm. here because you're not paying attention, but I am. Good point. I like to think I if you like you hear too, of a fire like, without hey, seeing, you guys got to go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I'm not going to take a lot of time trying to get people to pay attention no, to me. I'm, I'm just going to be like, yeah, exactly. Oh, yo, and as all, all you have to do is <laughs> just <laughs> run. Just run. People yeah. are going to follow you. Why are you running? Just get out of there. <laughs> exactly. <Yeah. laughs> okay. Hey, guys, we're going to be right back. I'm just going to play a short trailer from our good friend Frankie slash Amanda over at the Haunted and the Strange podcast. Please give them your support and give their trailer a listen. And if you want to take a pause once we're done to go make yourself a drink so you can honor Brutal, Bizarre, and Boozy the way nature intended, please do so. But we'll be right back in a jiffy. Hey, you. Yeah, you. Are you into weird shit? Yeah? You into cryptids? What about hauntings? Yeah, I've got a ghost for you. Oh, you like overworld the beans. Me too. Check out all these aliens. We have plenty. How do you feel about a good legend? Want to hear about spooky happenings? Yeah, you do. Let us show you what we've got. Hey guys, grab a drink and join us, Amanda and Sean, every week while we dive into the strange and haunting topics that have piqued our interest. See you over at The Haunted and the Strange wherever you get your podcasts. Stay spooky. So these questions are relevant to a story that I've been kind of itching to tell for a really long time. And I'm really glad that we can do this one together because this is, it features, in my opinion, one of like the most badass people in history. And she just so happens to be a woman. Um, But more than that, it it weaves a real tale that just proves that like no matter what, you cannot escape your fate. Like if, if nature, mother nature, mother fate, whatever, wants something to happen to you in your lifetime, it's just gonna happen. So um, I don't think there's any of necessarily avoiding that at a certain a certain point. Um, I also want to say that this this episode has a little bit of brutal and bizarre. <laughs> Perfect. Oh, okay. Perfect. Yeah. So for the first time in the new year, let's all cram together into our little time machine. Probably should have sprung for the larger model because there's four of us, but hindsight 2020 will fit. It's fine. So we're going to scroll back the little time machine dial like it's the Wheel of Fortune spinner. We're going all the way back to October 2nd, 1887. I know that's a long time, but don't worry. We're just stopping here for a second. We're just acknowledging the birth of a baby girl, this first child to happy and blissful parents, William and Catherine Jessup. William and Catherine are living in Ireland at this time, and this arrival of their newborn baby Of course, it's a joyous, momentous occasion, but it's also pushing some things into focus, mainly that they need to prioritize getting a better life than the one that they have because they're not really wealthy, they're not really doing great for themselves, and they want to make sure their children have more than they have. They name this beautiful baby girl Violet Constance Jessup. Is this ringing any bells to anybody? No. Oh, I love a new one. I love that. Yay. That's always what I hope for. Mm -hmm. So they spend the next few years caring for their new baby. They do pump out a couple more children, eight of them all together, um, but three of them pass away. So nine children. Well, I mean, you know, over the course of some time, but yeah, they did. They had um, eight plus Violet, so nine. Three of them pass away in their childhood of different varying things like they did at that time. As a young child herself, Violet begins to come down with some symptoms of what is thought at first to just be a cold, but after a strenuous fight, doctors diagnose her with tuberculosis. And they determine it's probably going to be terminal and she's probably not going to survive. So despite these stacking and ever-mounting odds against her, miraculously, Violet survives and she makes a full recovery. But again, her family are still like, 
we need better livelihoods. We got kids dying, you know, kids getting tuberculosis, and we got to do better for these children. So eventually, Violet, her siblings, and her parents make the perilous move from Ireland to South America, Bahia Blanca specifically, which is in Buenos Aires, Argentina. And they move there in hopes for a better life working as sheep farmers, which is not something I can necessarily say I'd move to South America to be, but to each their own. I wasn't in their shoes. Violet, at this point, she's, you know, a growing young lady. She helps around the house with chores, helps to care for her younger siblings. She is the oldest. And she's a bright and beautiful young lady at this point, about 16 years of age. And her life takes a sudden and drastic change. Her father, unfortunately, passes away from surgical complications. I couldn't find what surgery he was in for. But, of course, Violet and her siblings and mother are devastated. And it takes some time for Catherine to figure out how she's going to provide for her family now. Because he was really the guy doing the sheep farming. Um, And now she's on her own. She doesn't have the skill set nor the ability to perform much of this physical labor that's required. So she explores some new opportunities. And in 1903, Catherine and her children move again, this time to England. So once they're in England, Violet enrolls in a convent school, which I didn't know what that was. So I looked it up and it's like a very Christian institute where nuns kind of play the role of educators and teachers and um, very strict Catherine finally lands a job working as a stewardess for a civilian ocean liner company, which is great news because she has money coming in now to support her family. But the not so great news is she's now gone at sea for sometimes weeks at a time, which leaves poor young Violet to care for her siblings full time. So kind of a win lose. Yeah, lose Mm -hmm. more so for Violet. (laughs) Yeah. Things are going okay. Violet is still in school and her siblings are in school. She's, you know, kind of struggling to balance this new full-time responsibility of caring for her siblings. But it's not long before life again throws Violet and her family a curveball and Catherine gets pretty sick and she can't work. Unfortunately, the money stops, panic begins, and Violet doesn't know what to do. The only thing she can think to do is assume the role of provider. And so she quits school and she goes to try to find work. And where does she apply? Would you think this young lady is looking for work? I guess the boat. Yeah. So she's going to follow in her mother's footsteps and she applies to be a stewardess. Now, I mentioned before that she's a a good looking, you know, attractive young lady. Um, But I guess I don't know if guys were thirstier back then or maybe uh, women weren't as typically conventionally attractive. But she has a lot of problems getting a job because she's just so gorgeous. And she finally like dresses down, makes herself look. Yeah, these are her words from her autobiography. (laughs) I wish I had that problem. (laughs) Maybe she's a little pompous too. I'll never know. Um, Wow. But she dresses down and makes herself kind of less attractive so that she can be taken more seriously and be hired. And she eventually is. I guess nobody wants a pretty stewardess, which is, I feel like, the opposite you would want. Like, you come to my boat, have pretty ladies. Maybe. I don't know. Hard to rationalize that, if I'm being honest, but. It was a different time. It was a different time. (laughs) And Violet is 21 years of age, and she finally lands her first position of stewardess working aboard the Orinoco, which was a boat um, belonging to the Royal Mail Line. And this is in 1908. So what are some benefits to this job? Apart from obviously, you know, she's getting some time away from her family, which I'm sure is welcome after caring for them her whole life. And of course, she's got a source of income coming in. What are some things that could be appealing about this job to a woman like Violet at this age? I Money. think you wouldn't have to pay much for like rent or food or anything. They probably provide a lot of that stuff on the boat. You probably have a that place would to be stay. A good perk. You're not yeah. wrong. And you're, you're like not spending much money because you're stuck on a boat. You can't just like go shopping or I don't know. Also, wealthy, nice. uh, I guess, yep. wealthy men who are on men. the ship. Yep. That's what I would guess. Yeah. She's getting to meet some. Some men. Mm-hmm. Some networking. Some, hearing some coin purses jingling <laughs> sounds. Yeah. Isn't that what they had back then? Coin purses? <laughs> I don't know how they stowed their money. Uh-huh. She was looking for some riches. <laughs> probably. Yeah. Those were all probably very um, appealing, you know, at that age. So Violet does. And she gets this job for Royal Mail Line. And she is working with them for two years, just earning some experience and kind of learning the lay of the job. And she is eventually offered a highly prestigious position aboard a specific ship, the RMS Olympic. This is, at the time, the largest civilian ocean liner, and it's a luxury liner at that. But this boat belongs to the White Star Lines, which is Royal Mail Line's competitor. And Violet really enjoyed this boat. 
is such like a high class ship. It was so beautiful. It had original woodworking. Uh, I think, um, Oh my gosh, what is that really fancy thread made by worm silk, like silk embroidered uh, mm-hmm. furniture, just really high, high flutin, high tootin up there. Nice. More than I could probably afford for that time. <laughs> so, so this, like I said, this boat belonged to a different ocean liner and she's enjoying working for this, this company. But in 1910, while aboard the Olympic, after the ship leaves the Southampton port, the vessel collides with British warship, the HMS Hawk which does cause significant damage. So there was definitely threat that the ship might kind of capsize or sink, but amazingly the ship managed to make the journey back to the port and everyone on board was saved. Nobody perished. Um, Violet did not let this little mishap scare her. She's like, eh, it's fine. You know, there was no, no real drama. And she's back to working on the Olympic as soon as repairs are completed. So now we're going to follow Violet to April of 1912. That's a year that holds a lot of weight for some people. Does anyone know what's special about April of 1912? Nope, it was a long time Titanic? ago. Titanic? I don't know. Yeah. That's Titanic? the month the Titanic went down. Good. Yeah. Good observation. So for Violet, the Titanic was all a thing of the future. She was just working and minding her business, and she was told that she was being transferred from the Olympic to this new passenger ocean liner, this mm. unthinkable brand new ship. And that uh-huh. is the Olympic sister ship, the HMS the Titanic. Titanic. Yeah. So she's excited. Yes. Everyone is talking about this new ship and everyone loves newer stuff. It's bigger. It's better. She's 24 years old by this point. She hops unsinkable. aboard. It's the unsinkable, unsinkable ship. ship. Yes. <laughs> she hops aboard and on April 10th of 1912, it leaves port also from Southampton leading to New York City. It's where it's headed. Just four days in, as we all know, the Titanic strikes a massive iceberg in the dead of night, despite multiple warnings of icebergs in the travel path. But of course, eager to impress the passengers who paid a substantial amount of money for their travels in this brand new ship, they forged ahead at max speed anyhow, plowing into the iceberg. We all know what went on from there. Violet was actually ordered to the deck at that time and was asked to put on her life jacket and serve as a visual example of how to behave because of this impending crisis, and especially because a large number of passengers who spoke no English and did not have any ability to follow instructions being given. So she was just basically like a figurehead, like, do what I do, you know? So Violet just stood there, trying to be calm, trying not to add further turmoil to the situation, Um, and she watched as the first lifeboats were lowered into the water. Not long after, an officer on the Titanic orders her aboard lifeboat 16. So she quietly climbs onto the lifeboat. She's trying to settle in, trying to calm her nerves to begin the long and very terrifying process of lowering the lifeboat to the water, which is a great height. And at the last moment, an officer shoves a baby into her arms and is basically like, here, deal with this baby I found. There's no mother in sight. There's no just just random screaming baby. So she's like, not much I can do to disagree. What am I going to (laughs) do? You know, so she just holds the thing and tries to swaddle it into her clothing and keep it warm. The boat does finally touch the water and it sets out and they watch as the Titanic with the majority of the passengers now in the icy waters, two hours and 40 minutes after striking the iceberg sink below the surface of the water. Everything gets really quiet and the ship finally sinks. She can't really decide like what's more terrifying versus the chorus of screaming of all the people that were in the water or the complete silence now that those people have passed. But all night long, they're just in this lifeboat trying to stay warm, bobbing and dipping in the night. Luckily, the next morning, they were picked up by the RMS Carpathia, taken aboard to continue their voyage to New York City, which they did complete four days following. Violet said that once she boarded the Carpathia, a woman ran up to her, ripped the baby from her arms while crying hysterically, and then ran away without saying a word. She pretty much was like, well, I hope that's the mom, and carried yeah. on. <laughs> like, didn't literally do, yeah. did nothing about it. So, <laughs> hope so. Well, what's she going to do? <laughs> I mean, yeah, I guess you can't, but like, I may, I I might have mentioned kinda... it to a guard. Like, hey, some right, lady yeah. with this baby out of my arms. But she just kept it to herself and didn't say anything for like 70 more years until her interview about it. So wow. that happened. So hmm. luckily, she la- safely landed in New York finally after that whole tragedy. She almost immediately makes a return trip back to Southampton. And since commercial airfare wasn't a thing yet, I think it's safe to assume she probably got on another ship to go home, which is just crazy. After Terrifying. now two disasters at sea. I yeah, mean, nope. like a near miss and then a really near miss. Yeah. But Violet, she doesn't know anything else. You know, she's like, this is the only skill that I have. I don't have a full education to pursue other avenues. And she does des- decide for whatever reason to return to stewardessing for ocean liners. So like, girl, take a hint. 
God is trying to tell you something. But. <laughs> yeah. Probably shouldn't do this anymore. Yeah, you probably yeah. give this one a rest. Maybe go like stay on land, right? <laughs> Skip forward to 1916. By this point, we are in the midst of World War I. It's November 21st. It's early in the morning. Violet has been working for some time for the British Red Cross, and they had deployed Violet to the HMS Britannic, which was yet again another sister ship to both the Olympic and the Titanic. So she has a yeah. thing for these sister ships. But this ship at this time had been converted to like a floating hospital. They were trying to make like a makeshift ho- hospital at sea, and the ship traversed these large passages of the Kia Channel, which is in the Aegean Sea, um, near like the Mediterranean Ocean portions of the world. And this boat is intending to prov- provide care to provide care for soldiers injured in action. Very fortunately, the ship at this point doesn't have any patients on board. It's just staffed with dozens and dozens of doctors and medical staff and just a lot of people that are eager to start helping victims of this war. Violet was excited to put her skills to work to ensure that the medical teams could work as quickly, proactively, and productively as possible. She also had some personal reasons, though, to be on board. She was hoping to reunite with her brother, who is supposed to be heading to the same destination, but just on a different boat. Up until this fateful morning, her memories of the Titanic and the Olympic are just kind of recollections that come up at night. She's not really doesn't dwell on them by any means. However, Upon innocently forging through the Kia Channel this particular morning of November 21st, the HMS Britannic accidentally passes over a German naval mine, accidentally <sighs> detonating it, causing catatastrophic oh damage. Gosh. Yeah, third time. So this time, stay this off boat is, you know, I think if I were <laughs> no. like a coworker, I'd be yeah, like, you're not getting on. <laughs> it's like, in, like in your isn't there like, yeah, a it's so her. If you eat a banana on a boat, you're not going to catch a fish. Like, that's yeah, awesome. that's supposedly. An old fishing tale. Yeah. Maybe she's just not allowed to be on a boat without it sinking. Maybe <laughs> yeah. she is the banana. Yeah, she's the banana. Gosh. <laughs> that's funny. Violet yeah. the banana. Violet the banana. So this explosion by this naval mine, of course, it catastrophic damage. The boat actually sinks twice as fast as the Titanic. It only takes fifty five minutes for the entire thing to go down. But at the same moment that this happens, Violet is actually, like, caring for an ill nurse on board. And she had prepared some tea and some toast. And she's going down into their quarters and, like, to try to help encourage her to eat. And so she's literally the only staff member that doesn't really know what's going on. Like, she hears everything. She sees everybody run. She's left alone in this big dining area. And she's like, well, I don't know. I'm just going to continue my duties because that's what I know how to do is to steward. Uh, So I'm going to keep on stewarding. So she's down she's in the hole the caring for these. <laughs> she's I know she'd be the one to be like, get her up on board now. <laughs> yeah. So she goes and she cares for the sick nurse and she helps her get her clothes on and get her something to wear. And then they go back up top and Violet, you know, she's like very much different vibe when she gets up to the top deck, everybody's scurrying, everybody's freaking out. Um, she's not really sure what's going on. But she kind of looks over and she sees people jumping from um, lifeboats into the water. And she's like, that's weird. Why would people jump out of a lifeboat? You know, and they're lowering them as quickly as they can. She's not really, she has no ability to kind of speculate because her back is turned to the culprit. But then more staff are like, you know, basically being like faster, 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 lower than faster. She finally realizes what the problem is. The boat is taking on water in such a way that the propellers are actually now lifting out of the water. And the lifeboats are being lowered next to them. <gasps> and they're getting closer and closer oh. the more vertical the ship gets. So they're trying everything yeah. to try to avoid, you know, but they can only really yeah. lower them where the lowering tools are on, attached to. They don't really have a way to move where they're lowering. So people are climbing into these lifeboats and then getting dangerously close to these giant rotating propellers. Uh, sadly, uh, one of the boats actually did collide oh. with the propeller and it shredded Ooh. all 30 oh. people like a paper oh. shredder. Pretty violently. Oh, yeah. So Violet sees this happen, and then the officers are like, "Okay, get into this lifeboat." And she's like, "Um, no, nah. <laughs> kind of would rather take nah. my chances up here." Yeah. But the boat is quickly sinking, so they push her in a boat. And again, the boat gets way too close to the propellers, and just before it slices them to bits, everybody jumps out and plummets the long distance into the water. She does survive, but she suffers a traumatic brain injury at this point from jumping into wow. the water. Yeah, really, really sad. And of course, the terrified crew are all watching as they're trying to get everybody into these lifeboats and they're 
their boat's getting more vertical and they're watching it sink. It just sounds really terrifying to have to, or just the third time to go through something like yeah. this. And the second time to be in the water from it, like to, to physically be in a lifeboat. So she's floating around in the water, waiting for a boat to come pick her up and pluck her out of the water. And she does share this tale, this really chilling tale of a man that she saw beside her that was kind of bobbing in the water at the same time with her. And I kind of want to play this. I took a a short video recording. Now, this is an interview that she did in 1970. So she's quite old. And as you can imagine, the audio recording capabilities of that time were not the greatest. So I'm not going to play much, but I just want to play this short story that she tells about a man that was in the water next to her when they were plucking people out following this disaster. I'm going to turn the volume up. But um, presently, I heard a noise and... uh, a young man who was partly submerged called out and he, he must have seen it. I didn't see it. Saw the life of one of our launches come towards him. Mm. And he called out, there's a woman in the water. And then I looked towards to see him and the poor thing. Um, our uh, on board medical, the, not the ship's company, but the um, head. He was a man who was very much disliked, the head of this officer, mm. and he was standing up in the boat, and he called, this young fellow called out, and uh, he asked to be picked up. He said, wait your turn. And I think I hated, I hated that man from that moment. I, well, I need to say, fancy anybody. And he said, I've lost my arm, sir. Well, he said, wait your turn. And he was standing up in... In his regiment, because they're quite all right. They yeah. had a gun, I would have shot him. Yeah. Terrible. And this poor chap went down. He, he, no, he didn't survive. No, he went down because he was, I mean, he lost one arm. Yeah. And I, I suppose it's very difficult to try and swim with one arm. Especially if you're not shark, shark and lost the blood as well. Yes, yeah. terrible. And, uh, and, and, uh, and then I, I never forgot. So that was a tale that, if that was hard to understand, she was telling a story about when um, an officer was standing in a boat pulling survivors from the water. A man who had one arm amputated by the propeller was basically drowning and asked to be rescued. And the guy told him to wait his turn. And he drowned and fell under the surface. So that is just so sad because there's no name attached to that poor guy. And I bet he was a doctor or medical staff of some kind. And I'd really love to be able to share his story and keep it alive as well as violets but there's there's no name attached to that story unfortunately it's just a nameless victim to that tragedy so so i did want to play that snippet because that was one of the more chilling parts to her 30 minute interview but somehow violet miraculously survives again the like i said the whole ship sunk in just under 55 minutes after the blast and there was 1066 people on board Amazingly, only 28 to 30 of them perished, most of them from the collision with the propellers, but 40 or more people were injured during their loading into the lifeboats. Um, Very, very disturbing. So Violet recovered yet again from her next near-death experience. It seems like she's collecting them at this point. There's not much information on what she did for the few years following the Britannic sinking, but in 1920, she went back to her passion, returned to White Star Lines, and started stewarding for their passenger liners. She eventually left them and returned to her original. Nope. Yeah, I said no. No. She she needs, they need to be telling everybody that works with her on that ship her history. Because I'm not getting on a boat (laughs) with that woman. No. I don't want to know. No. I don't want to be anywhere near her. Yeah. Yeah. You're not wrong. I definitely wouldn't board a boat she was on just because I'm like, yeah, no, No. thank you. Get off. But that's her passion, and she she works for White Star, and then she leaves them and goes back to her original employer, which was Blue Mail Line, and she works the rest of her career without any noticeable incident, amazingly, after all. I guess she did enough for a lifetime. Um, But she does eventually marry at 36 years of age to a man named John James Lewis, who was also a steward for the White Star Line. They live a beautiful life, and Violet passed away at the rich age of 83 years old in 1971 from congestive heart failure. Um, and relevant complications. Her ba- body was laid to rest in Great Ashfield, which is in Suffolk, England, and buried next to her sister and her brother-in-law. So her story wow. is quite unbelievable just because who survives? I mean, to survive the Titanic alone was pretty yeah. impressive. And then you have two other boat disasters in there too. It's pretty nuts. So. Oh, it's my what are your thoughts on this nightmare. one? I know. I hate that. 
I hate the open ocean and just like <laughs> being on a boat and it crashing and oh my god, that sounds terrifying. Yeah, but yet we've been on a bunch of cruises and you like them. Yeah, but those don't feel like boats. It's, it's like a <laughs> <That's> <laughs> like, I've never been on a cruise before, so I wouldn't know. Oh yeah, I imagine it would feel like a small city. It does. No, it doesn't feel like you're on a boat. It it's I don't know. I love cruises. Of like thirty foot five thirty five foot boats and those those scare me. Really? Like that. Yeah. I love boats, but it does scare me to think about I mean the thing that scared me the most is learning because I didn't know this prior to doing research for this. The Titanic was only four days into an eight-day trip, so they were about halfway. So they truly mm. were in the middle of the freaking ocean. With nothing. Cool. Like, oh with nothing. Oh, freaking cold, yeah. man. Yeah. Yeah. And I also want to say that there was enough space for Jack to get on that little piece. <laughs> <laughs> he could have survived, but he just wanted to yeah. forget this. Yes. Dive right in. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Just so I'm glad you brought up the Titanic movie because we do have a little bit of a pop culture reference with the story. So Violet's story has popped up really, really quickly. I mean, truly quickly in little tiny insignificant ways in a lot of major movies. But she did. There was a character who was supposed to depict Violet in the Titanic movie. Can anyone oh. think of who that might have wow. been? It was like a literal one liner. She was like one scene. But it's one that stands okay. out because I did mention I, in our story. I don't remember that movie at all. I don't blame you. Yeah, that was like t- <laughs> 20 years ago. Yeah, it was a long time ago that I saw one. that. But I could watch it. I could have watched it yesterday and probably have forgotten it. So, <laughs> <laughs> Well, the scene that depicts her. Was she holding is, a baby in that scene? No, 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 no. Yeah. I know that would have made almost more sense. But no, there's a tiny little scene in Titanic where Andrews, one of like the captain guys, the, the guy who made the ship or whatever, he finds a nurse named Lucy, or a, uh, not a nurse, a stewardess, and he says, Lucy, do me a favor. Put on your life vest for me just to show the other passengers that are, you know, like to mm-hmm. convince them all to do the same and to be a good role model mm-hmm. like for the other passengers. That one blip was an homage to Violet because she had that very same thing. She was told to put on the wow. life vest and serve as a as a visual aid to people who couldn't speak English or follow instructions. So I thought that was kind of cool. Wow, that is yeah. cool. That's cool. And then our little too cool for school fact about this episode is along with Violet, there were actually two other Titanic survivors who were also working as stewards aboard the Britannic who also survived. Oh. So she's not the only one who's mm. okay. done two. She's not the only bad luck person. <laughs> no, there's I, three I of them. Definitely apparently. don't want to get one on a ship with any of those people. Boats. Yeah. It's gotta be. They're the jinx. Yeah. So now your guys' opinion has changed a little bit about about your. Do you feel any differently about your race car things? If this was something where you were getting in repeated accidents, like trapped in burning cars multiple times and escaped within an inch of your life, is that cha- is this changing anything for you? You still like no? I, nah, I like still <laughs> want to race cars. <laughs> I feel like look at Jane. She's just looking at him. Just looking at him. Look at that. <laughs> just like I, I think there's a big difference though because. Being a race car driver, that's like the adrenaline and the rush. And, you know, even if you, if you win, that's amazing. If you lose, I mean, you're still, you still have a lot of money. Cars. You and I have a lot of money to do it too. Right. I don't think you can compare driving a race car to being a stewardess on a boat. I'm terrified of the ocean. I couldn't, I could never. No, you would never. <laughs> no. no. <laughs> you know, it'd be cool if you guys did a show where Declan's driving a car around the, the, the thing and you guys are actually <laughs> doing a show and you're in like the mixing the drink and whatnot in the car <laughs> right. as he's going ni- 120. It'll be your last episode. Be yes. So cool. <laughs> yes, like Top Gear. We'll do our own Top yeah. Gear. There you go. Oh. Oh, nice. Very good. Yeah. I like how throughout you guys were like, yeah, no, we'd be done with the boats. I'm there with you. I can't yeah. say I would board another ship after the first time. I probably would have been done. No, so I don't have it. I <laughs> love cruises and I've been on a lot. And thank God there's never been any 
issues on any of them. But I, if I was on one, I don't know that I would want to get back on another one if there was a problem with it. I like that. Yeah. Although I kind we of think about the yet. odds of things. Like, what like, are the odds that this would happen again? Oh, yeah. Three, three three times times one. I'm one. done. I love the first one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, that's especially the fact that she was able to recover from the Titanic and go back to work and then not wow. even be scarred by having to go through that yeah. again. She would do it again and then still kept going. It's like, right. if you want to die, girl, just say that. Like, yeah. just vocalize it. Don't. I guess PTSD wasn't a thing back in the 1920s. <laughs> Or if you had it, you were yeah. a witch. She's like, I gotta right. conceal that. Real quick. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's wild to me. And being that this is now our second in a row episode of people who survive disasters at sea and go back to working in the ocean, our question of the week right. for the next one is going to be: If you were a survivor of a disaster at sea, would you ever step foot on a boat or a ship again? Because I want to know how common this is. This is not the first time. The last one was a guy who oh. lost all of his friends to shark attacks after his boat capsized. Yeah. So what's yeah. with these guys on boats and women on boats that want to keep I going? Don't I don't understand. I need to I make sense boats, of it. Boats are fun, but only if they're on like a lake or a river. The ocean is... I'm good. Sharks. Okay. Too many scary things in there. I, yeah. After the yeah. first boating accident, I would be done. <laughs> Why oh, Why do you keep pausing it? Because I have some really great trailers from some really great podcasts, and I want you guys to hear about them. Please take a second and listen to a trailer by our buddies over at Let's Talk About Podcast. This one's different than the last one that we played last episode, so give it a listen. I think you're going to like it, if you know what I mean. <laughs> wink, wink, wink. <laughs> Hello guys, and welcome to Let's Talk About. My name's Liam. And my name's Billy. And on this podcast, we have absolutely no limits whatsoever. Genuinely, no topic is off limits for us. We speak about ghosts, aliens, supernatural, and much more. We want to get you guys involved as much as possible with our podcast journey. Every Sunday, we'll have a brand new episode, and we'll even let you guys decide on some of those episodes or what happens in them. So far, we've spoken about ghosts, aliens, zombies, and even a talking mongoose. Can't be the talking mongoose. Follow and subscribe to Let's Talk About. So that is it for this episode. That is the tragic story of Violet Constance Jessup. Our hint for the next episode, which airs on January 23rd, is never interrupt your enemy when he is making a mistake. That one, uh, we have another fantastic mm. guest as usual. Sounds Our sources for this episode. Uh, most everything I collected from her interview regarding her experiences, because I felt like that was going to be the most accurate out of anything. So she does have a 32-minute interview out there. There are parts where it's not very audible. It's not my fault. It was the 70s. What do you want from me? But then I also checked on findagrave.com, Wikipedia, National Geographic, and Irish Central, um, which all had other facts that weren't included in the original interview. So. I have, um, let me turn my camera on for this. You guys can see her. So since, you know, I really talked up that she was like a looker, I found a photo that someone had colorized. And this is the photo that she took once she got her nurse's uniform for the Britannic. So I don't know if that's going to be very visible with my phone screen, but oh, yeah. is that so wow. hot you wouldn't hire that? Is that? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about that. Yeah, she no. was... Very devout to her job, so I'll give her that. But I thought that was really funny that in this big autobiography thing, like a memoir that she wrote about her life, that she's like, I was too pretty for this job. I had to be ugly. <laughs> like, okay, girl, was that necessary to include? <laughs> oh, that's funny. And then I have oh. our joke of the day. I'm yeah. Ready for this one. Oh, I will apologize mm-hmm. because there, it's really hard to find steward related jokes that don't like s- kind of sway towards the more adult theme but this is like a <laughs> pg we like adult theme okay good she does like adult I theme i know but i'm 
like, how yeah. awkward might this be for Declan? You know, when you're with your mom and That's the sex scene is on TV. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. So, our joke of the day. A beautiful New York woman was so depressed that she decided to end her life by throwing herself into the ocean. But just before she could throw herself from the docks, a handsome young steward stopped her. You have so much to live for, said the steward. Look, I'm off to Europe tomorrow, and I can stow you away on my ship. I'll take care of you, I'll bring you food every day, and I'll keep you happy. With nothing to lose, combined with the fact that she had always wanted to go to Europe, the woman accepted. That night, the sailor brought her aboard, the steward <laughs> brought her aboard and hid her in a lifeboat. From then on, every night he would bring her three, three sandwiches and make love to her until dawn. Three weeks later, she was discovered by the captain during a routine inspection. What are you doing here? asked the captain. I have an arrangement with one of the stewards, she replied. He brings me food and I get a free trip to Europe. Plus, he's screwing me. He certainly is, replied the captain. This is the Staten Island Ferry. <laughs> <laughs> so I just thought that was funny. Cute steward joke. <laughs> oh, that's nice. I like oh, that. Uh, I was like, this with a smile. <laughs> Brutal, bizarre, like and boozy. Joke. Please tell us where we can find your podcast. Where can we listen to you and review you with beautiful five star ratings? And where can we follow you on social media? So for we are. On all major podcast platforms, Brutal, Bizarre, and Boozy, you can find us on Facebook. We have both um, a fan page and then also uh, the page that we post all of our links to and uh, our posts that are the same as Instagram. So if you want to find us on Instagram, that works too. Um, on Instagram, we are Brutal underscore Bizarre underscore Boozy. Yeah, and you can listen to us anywhere. If you, we always love getting reviews. Um, if you write an Apple review, we will read it on one of our episodes. Or if you are not big into writing reviews, you can always just click that rate five stars on uh, Spotify. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you guys so much for taking time out of your day today to come on yeah, come on board. For having and us. Yeah, listen to our dorky little episodes, but I had fun too. Yeah, we'll have to definitely do this again and find like a a abomination of a drink creation to try and be disgusted. Yes, yeah, that would be fun. You guys have a great dynamic, by the way. I think you guys are great together. A lot of respect to both of you because I don't know if I can do a show with my mother. I don't know. Oh, I couldn't. (laughs) Oh, I could not. No way. You do. You have a really cool mom. I try. <laughs> I, I found myself that. trying to be respectful. I didn't want to say any bad words. <laughs> I know oh, you were the most oh, behaved yeah. you've been in a while. Yeah, I was even very behaved. <laughs> yeah, I didn't oh, pee in the time yeah. machine. Usually I do. Yes. Yeah, I appreciate that you did not pee in the time machine this time. <laughs> I, appreciate that. You, Jane, that. I appreciate just that. for you. If it was just Declan, it would have been all over the place. <laughs> No, you know, no, I have to mark my territory. You know what I'm saying? Yes. yes. Yeah. <laughs> oh, God. Well, thank you thank guys. Thank you so again. much, guys. Thank yeah, you. Thanks. Everybody thank you. listening, please go follow Brutal Bazaar and Boozy if you had as good of a time as we did here with them. And don't forget until next time. Stay, stay alive. alive.